wasn't that long ago. It's a very interesting conversation. I simply was making a transaction there at the counter <clears throat> with the young lady. She saw my kids, particularly one of my grandchildren, and she made a reference and she said, you seem like you have a very nice family. And of course, I thanked her for that. And I proceeded to pull out of my billfold a card regarding the Church of Christ in the area of which I was. I sometimes like to do that, and of course here as well. And I said, would you like to know why? And I handed her that card that referenced the Lord's Church in that particular location. What I was not ready for is what happened next. Instantly, immediately, she began to cry. Tears coming down her cheeks. She kind of grabbed her face to try to hide her tears. And she said, I've been praying about some of these things. She said, my brother died last week. I made sure she had the number to the local preacher there, as well as my wife's cell phone since she was a female. I don't know if she'll ever follow up on that or what she will or won't do with that opportunity, but I told her, that she had the opportunity to study, to know about God, if she would like to do that. And I, I've thought about that, that particular interaction. It reminds me of our lesson today. In Acts chapter 17, in verse number 16, I want to read several passages from the book of Acts. As I entitled the sermon today, The Beauty of the Glorious Gospel, or simply the Glorious Gospel. In Acts 17, in verse number 16, you have here... This. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw, present tense, kept on seeing, the city wholly given to idolatry. If you go back to 16th chapter of Acts, chapter 16, verse 9, you're probably familiar with this particular text. It says in Acts 16 and verse number 9, in a vision, there appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed unto him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And then, of course, I think about Acts 18 and verse number 5, Acts 18 and 5. And when Silas and Timotheus were coming from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. We are commanded to go into all the world and to preach the gospel, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, to preach the gospel to every creature. We understand that involves teaching them the gospel so that they would be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, verses 18 and following, because all power and authority has been given unto Jesus. We know there's salvation in no other name, Acts 4 and verse number 12. And, and we also understand in Romans chapter 1, particularly in verse 14, he said, I'm a debtor. Paul, why are you a debtor? Because of what Christ did for me. He goes on then in verse number 16, a very famous verse, and he says in Romans 1 and 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, as he quotes that Old Testament passage used about three times in the New Testament. And so when I think about the glorious gospel, this morning I have but three quick and simple points. Number one, what is it? Number two, why is it glorious? And number three, what should I do with this glorious gospel? If you were to look up the word gospel in your New Testament or on a King James app as I like to do, you would find it's used over a hundred times, this word gospel. But only twice did I find where it's referenced as the glorious gospel. And we'll get to those passages in a little bit. Matthew 11 and verse number 5, and there's two passages in Luke I'll, I'll go to later, but in Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 5, often Jesus would go about preaching the gospel of the kingdom, but in Matthew 11 and verse 5, I like the way that it's worded here. Jesus in verse 4 says unto to, to these uh, brothers, he says, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. John was in prison, he was depressed, and I love verse 5 of Matthew 11. He said, you know, John, you want to come out of this depression, you, you may die, and he would die, but do you want to know what it's all about, verse 5, and that I am who I claim to be, the Messiah, verse 5? He says, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached 
unto them. The gospel, it's called a mystery in Romans 16, 25, but it's not a mystery anymore. It was a mystery how God would save Jew and Gentile in one church, in one body. And of course, it's revealed in the New Testament how he would do that. So what is this gospel? What is the glorious gospel? What do we mean by this terminology? Well, if you're familiar with the Greek, you have, of course, the word gospel, euangelion, if you were to break that down, you think about the EU broken down from the agalizo. The EU, think about well or good, eulogy, you probably heard that word, to speak well of, to speak good. And then agalizo from agalos, which is where we get our word angel, which simply means what? Messenger. And so uh, uh, the uh, agalizo is the idea of a good news, good tidings from a messenger. And so uh, euangelion means the good news, the message of God. What is the gospel? It's glorious. What is it? Well, let's let the Bible define it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is about the best place I know to go to to show you what the gospel is, or at least begin to show you what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, this good news, these glad tidings, this euangelion, chapter 15, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Remember Romans 1, we're not ashamed of. Which I have preached unto you. So the gospel, this good news, must be preached. No wonder Jesus and his apostles would often preach the gospel of the kingdom, saying, believe and repent, or repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it says here, which you received, he's writing to the Christians at Corinth. He said, I preached it, you received it, and you stand in it, by which also you were saved. Now that's getting my attention. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Okay, Paul, give us some more. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. So in other words, God gave it to him, he gave it to us. That's revelation, that's inspiration. He said in verse 3, how that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures. How many Old Testament prophecies could we look at on that? And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So we could go to the Old Testament. We could see the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. We could study Isaiah 53. We could go to the book of Psalms. Psalm 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110, Psalm 22, etc., etc., but he simply says what the gospel is. It's the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. He then goes into the witnesses of this resurrection. He says in verse 5, And he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part is rema remains under this present, when the book was written. But, but some have died, fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all he was seen of me as one born out of due season. You begin to study all of these witnesses in verse 6, particularly on one occasion, seen of 500 at one time. What is the gospel, Jason? The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Acts 1, 1 and following, refers to that. And it's called the passion. You think about the passion plays that often people speak of. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 1. Let's look at this glorious gospel and what it is just a little bit more. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel. Again, good news, glad tidings. Death, burial, resurrection. Which he had, had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, by whom ye have received grace and apostleship, or verse 4 rather, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, that's referring to his deity, he would do miracles, he would come forth from the grave, notice, by the resurrection from the dead. So I can simply say, what is the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Jesus, of course, through prophecy in the Old Testament, would come into this world. He would, be, he would come in, as, as a Jew, born of the Jewish nation. That's why God prepared that nation. That's why He prepared that land and that people to bring the Messiah to us. That's Genesis 12, the great promises given to Abraham. Great land promise, nation promise, and seed promise. And someone says, Jason, that's basic. Yes, but so many people still don't understand it. You see it in veiled form in Genesis 3.15. What do you have to believe about? The Bible often talks about believing the gospel. I'll show you some scriptures in a minute. 
What do you have to believe? Well, well everything that it teaches. Genesis 3.15, that seed of the woman, that's the virgin birth, would bring forth the son. Isaiah 7.14 speaks of the virgin birth. Fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. Joseph was confused. The angel came and said, well, listen, Joseph, don't get upset or put her away. She hasn't sinned. The Holy Spirit was involved in this. There's no man involved. Jesus would be born of a virgin. You have to understand that. He was born of a virgin. He lived. He, taught, he, he did miracles. He walked on the water. He healed the blind. He healed the sick. The gospel was, had the gospel preached unto the poor and so forth. And so you see all of these facts. One of my favorite places in the New Testament is the book of John at the very end of that book. I hope you turn there with me. John chapter 20. Remember, Thomas wasn't with the other apostles at the first whenever Jesus manifested himself. And in John chapter 20... Uh, you see this in a verse number, really start in verse 24, John 20, verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. He's, of course, come forth from the grave. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, uh, uh, except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I, I will not believe. Verse 26, and after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Simply a miracle. Verse 27, then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Don't you love this? Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast believed, or because thou hast seen me, hast thou believed? Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his names, through his name. Therefore, we find that the glorious gospel is, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, of course, but it's more than just that. In fact, in Galatians chapter 2, you can turn there if you want to, in verse 11 and following, Peter sinned. Peter was a hypocrite. And Paul rebukes Peter, and he says, here's why he's doing it, and read Galatians 2, 11 and following. It says, because he walked not according to the truth of the gospel. In fact, if you go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1, let's just turn there very quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 1, you're going to see in verse 11 that here a reference is made to this glorious gospel. But notice what it's connected with in 1 Timothy 1.10. It's connected with doctrine or teaching. He lists all of these sinful people and he says, this is what the gospel is about, saving people from that stuff, these sins, these these." transgressions of God's law, 1 Timothy 1.10, for homemongers, for, for them to defile themselves with mankind, again, think about sexual sin, homosexual, kidnappers, men stealers, if you will, liars, perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. So we see that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection, but it's also all of the teachings of Christ that involves all the doctrine of the New Testament because that's why Paul rebuked Peter when he walked not according to the truth of the gospel. So when we say the gospel, we, we do mean clearly the death, burial, and resurrection, but that is simply, but there's more than that. I know that's the case because the gospel must also be obeyed. You see, you have to obey the gospel, you have to believe it and you have to obey it. Well, Jason, give me proof of that. Okay, Acts 15 in verse number 7. You have the Jerusalem council. And in Acts 15, 7, he's talking about the Gentiles and how they should be saved the same as the Jews were saved. Acts 15, 7, and when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel, Paul's, does that not remind you of 1 Corinthians 15? It was preached. It was believed. It was received. They have to stand in it. He said, by my mouth should the God, Gentiles hear the word of the gospel and believe. That would include John 8, 24. Jesus said, except you believe that I am, you shall die in your sin. Someone says, well, I believe he, I believe he died on a cross, but he didn't come forth from a grave. You can't become a Christian. 
Well, I believe he died on the cross, but he wasn't born of a virgin. Then you can't become a Christian. I believe that he was a good man, but he's not God. Then you can't become a Christian. You have to believe that he is who he claimed to be, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, performed miracles, died on the cross, buried in a tomb, come forth in the grave, that he was God but also man. You have to understand all of those things or you will die in your sin, John 8 and verse number 24. That's what the Bible teaches. But you have to believe it, but you also have to obey it. Three times this phrase is referenced in the, in the New Testament. Romans 10, verse 18, quoting Isaiah, he says, But Isaiah hath said, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Go read Romans 10, 13 and follow. That, that's what it is to call on the name of the Lord means to obey his teaching, which we know involves baptism, Acts 22, 16. 1 Peter chapter 4 talks about judgment beginning at the house of God. It says, how much worse will it be on those that have not obeyed the gospel? as well as 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, that very famous passage in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, when he's coming back with flaming fire, taking vengeance on those that know not God and obey not the gospel. So the gospel is the facts. The gospel involves everything we need to teach in the New Testament that starts with who Jesus was, what he did for us, and it culminates in us obeying his will or being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, Acts 2.38. Hence, obeying the gospel, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. This glorious gospel, I've already shown you one of the verses, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and about verse 10 and 11 there. The other place that phrase is used is in 2 Corinthians. Turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this phrase, the glorious gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it was our scripture reading beginning in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. Now, when you're reading your Bible and you see the term therefore, it's telling you there's something above it. Based on what was just said, therefore. So then we would go back into chapter 3. I love chapter 3. Chapter 3 is talking about Moses whenever he received the Ten Commandments, and then remember he had to put this veil on because he was glowing and the people were afraid. Go read Exodus 19 and 20. Go read Deuteronomy chapter 5 and other passages. And so if you just pick up in verse number 12 of, of, of 2 Corinthians 3, seeing then we, ha we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put, you, put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel, think Old Testament, could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was to be abolished. That's going to be abolished because it's going to be in the New Testament. But their minds were blinded. You're going to connect that with chapter 4, verse 4 in just a moment. But their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. I want you to pause for just a moment and contemplate verse 14. You know, in Acts 13 and in Acts 15, we're not going to look it up for lack of time, it says several times they were reading the Scriptures every Sabbath day. That's Old Testament, they were on the Sabbath. How many people in this land, in this country, in this town, even right now, have the Scriptures read? All the there are men who have literally memorized the Bible. There are men I know who have memorized the Bible, and they aren't even New Testament Christians. Now, they think they are. They know what it says, but they haven't made proper application, and so they don't understand it. It was the same thing in the Old Testament with many people. It says that they, they, they had this Old Testament, but they don't understand that it was to be done away in Christ. Look at verse 15. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall come, when it shall turn, that's their hearts, to the Lord, the veil, think about the Old Testament, shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Do not miss verse 18. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, a mirror, the glory of the Lord, I love this, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see, the Bible should change us to be like Him. Verse, four, or verse 1 of chapter 4, Therefore... Seeing we have this ministry, as we have re received mercy, we faint not. He's talking to Christians. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Think about cunning. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully, that is to trap or bait, but by manifestation of the truth. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, think the Satan, the devil, 
hath blinded the minds, just like back in chapter 3, their minds were blinded. He says, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light, here it is, of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Yes, this gospel is something that's plain. It's easy to understand. And my friends, it must be preached, believed, and obeyed. It is something that is for all, John three sixteen, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. I want you to see this one. And so I want you to turn over there to the book of Titus. I hope you get excited when you read the Scriptures and understand this is God's Word. Titus 2 and verse number 11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Think about Jesus and His Word, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. Where? In this present age. Looking for, deep looking, continual looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That sharps rule, by the way. It's saying that Jesus is God here and that He's our Savior who gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from iniquity and purify Himself under peculiar people zealous of good works. We're talking about the gospel, the glorious gospel. It's for all. It is not cheap. It is not something that is cheap. Mark 15 in fact, if you just want a quick look, you can go to Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, but I'd just like to go to Mark 15. You want to talk about how expensive the gospel was for God? Think about what Jesus did for us. Mark 15, you can go to verse number 14. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried the more out exceedingly, Crucify him. Verse 15, and so Pilate, willing to condemn the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him. Think about a beating. That, one, you can't understand a beating like this. The praetorium guard was there, verse 17, and they clothed Jesus in purple. It's going to mock him. And plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. That's, that's a light way to say they forcibly rammed it on his head. They began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him. Verse 19, they spit on him. Verse 20, they mocked him. Verse 20, they crucified him. Go study Isaiah 52, how his visage was marred more than any man. Or also it says in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is there as, as well, chapter 50 I think it is, that they pull out the hair from his, from his face. Jesus had a beard. They're ripping the hair out of his face. They're spitting on him. They're mocking him. They're ridiculing him. They're beating him. They crucify him. I think about Pilate when he looks at Jesus on one occasion and says, Behold the man. And again, Isaiah says there's never been a man marred like that. No, it's not cheap. It's not cheap for what it costs God to give the gospel to us. It's glory. That's why it's glory. You see, the gospel involves everything I talked about. The facts, the need to obey, believe it, obey it. Repent from one's sins and, and do God's will. But it also is glorious because of what it costs God to give it to us. It is that pearl of great price, if you will. Can I just say this much? Because of what God did for us, we should think about what we should do for Him. Think about what we should do for God because of what He did in giving us this glorious gospel. And can I just say before I go to this final point, I want to talk just a little bit more about how glorious it is. You know, it was, it's, been a, it's been a long time ago now, I guess. I was in a rocking chair, and I rocked over the back of a cat, uh, or, or I think that's what happened. But anyway, the cat broke its tail in some way. I think that's what happened. But it broke its tail. I can't remember exactly what happened. But it, the cat broke its tail. You have never heard the screaming and pain this little cat was in. But my daughter Jenna was even in more pain because her little cat was injured. We threw the cat in a little kennel thing and took it to the vet and I remember her crying she was a little girl and she says daddy I'm just so worried about my cat and the little cat's hurting we give it to the vet they remove the tail and the cat's still with us to this day but I say that story to get you to understand something how many animals had to die in the Old Testament hundreds a thousand a million there were millions of Israelites they had daily sacrifices. They had personal sacrifices. I don't know how many tens of millions of animals, and if they would have had a voice, they could have, the brute beast, but if they would have had a voice, they could have cried out and said, why am I dying? I, what have I done to deserve to shed my blood? And God would say, because of sin, 
Sin, that's why, in every animal that ever died, in every prophet that ever came, in every apostle that ever preached, in every person who's ever obeyed the gospel, even now, we all look back and think about those things, and they all pointed to the coming of Jesus Christ and the need to shed his blood for my sin and for yours. And my friends, that's why the gospel is glorious, because it takes men's sins away. Oh, that I had time, and I have the verses, I have the verses on redemption. In fact, Romans 3.23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. The very next verse, verse 24, talks about the redemption which is in Christ. I have a verse on reconciliation, Hebrews 2.17. That means to make friends again. I have a verse on forgiveness. No, I have two, Acts 13.38 and Acts 26.18. I have verses on hope, Colossians 1.5. All the way read Colossians 1. I have verses on salvation and eternal life. I could quote or reference these verses and we could go to them all. But I want you to understand that every time you read about redemption being bought back, reconciliation being made friends again, forgiveness, that is the release, the removal of sin, the hope, the mercy, the grace, the ability to start over, to be born again. The Bible, by the way, talks about that in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 15. We've been begotten, same language, through the gospel. Yes, it's glorious because of what God did for us. My question would be this morning, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with the gospel? Well, we need to make sure we don't reject it. We need to love the truth and obey the gospel. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is some interesting language. When you study 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we know there's a setting and a context here, but it talks about those that love not the truth. And then in verse 11, it says, For this cause God shall send them a strong delusion. Notice verse 10, They, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. That's what the gospel is all about. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion. The American standard says a working of error. Do you understand that if you want to believe a lie, God will let you believe that lie? He doesn't want you to believe it. God wants all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4. He sent Jesus to save the whole world, but the whole world won't be saved. Why? They don't love the truth. They don't love the glorious gospel. They don't want the, what the gospel requires of them. And let me just say this much. The gospel is also not cheap for you and for what you must do. You don't believe that? Turn to Mark chapter 8. The gospel is going to cost you everything you have. Jason, it's free. Yes, it's free. But it's going to cost you everything you have. Well, how, how, is, how can something that's free cost me everything I have? It's free to obtain it, but it costs you obedience and a sacrifice of living a certain way after you obey it. Romans 8, verse number 34. Mark, I'm sorry, Mark 8, 34. Mark 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people unto him with the disciples, and he asked and said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall a man profit if he's gained the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words, this is Jesus speaking, in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angel. Now y'all have heard me preach before, and sometimes I get kind of excited. I'm not that excited today. I'm trying to be, you know, a little bit more uh, polished, I guess. But y'all heard me get excited about various things, you know, people that strip all their clothes off, drink beer, cuss, smoke cigarettes, do dope, beat their wife. I don't care whatever sin you want to list. Jason, why do you, you know why I do that? Because, because the gospel, Jesus died so we don't live like that. Jesus died so we are different than the world. We don't talk like the world. We don't think like the world. We don't act like the world. We don't do what the world does. Why? Because we've been saved by the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And my friends, it is glorious. And let us never think otherwise. What is it? Everything the Bible describes. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Jesus, born of a virgin, died on a cross, stayed three days in the tomb, burst forth in glorious splendor from the grave, conquered death. He was the first to die so that when I die, I too have the hope of resurrection. There is nothing more beautiful than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are not ashamed of it. We will not back up from it. We will not change it. We will not reduce it. And when I began to study my Bible and I read words in that very text we were in, 2 Corinthians 4, 2, 
about those who handle the Word of God deceitfully. You go to 2 Corinthians 2.17, it talks about some who corrupt the Word of God. They literally make it, that, that word corrupt there in 2 Corinthians 2.17 is the idea of a huckster. Now you young people don't know what that means. It's, it's, it's a peddler who would sell wine, some, as an example, but he would dilute that wine with water so you're not really getting everything you think you're getting. And so we've seen some of these things today. You know that same hamburger that costs $7 now still costs, well, it's probably $9 now, but it's smaller. Same burger, but smaller, so it's not the same burger, and it's more money. You see, you don't catch those things. So some of this corruption going on, it says, it speaks of those, we're not like those who corrupt the Word of God. Here, I'm making a point here. Men can handle it deceitfully. They can corrupt it. They can make it void by their traditions, traditions of men. That means when they bind it as God's law. They pervert it, Galatians 1, that whole passage on the gospel. He says to those that pervert the gospel of Christ, he says if an angel comes unto you, if another man comes unto you, if anybody comes unto you, that's a gospel of a different kind, which is not, which is not a gospel of the same kind. We can add to it, Proverbs 30. We can take from it, Revelation 22. We can rest it and twist it, 2 Peter 3, 17, 16 and following, which is like a bone being twisted out of joint. Jeremiah 23 talks about those who have a vision of their own heart. You ought to connect that with Jeremiah 17, 9, where he talks about the heart is deceitful above all things. Or you could go to Jeremiah 23, 31, where God, they said God says something, but God didn't actually say it. Or my favorite probably is Acts 15, 24, where it says they were troubling people with words. Jason, what's your point of all that? If we believe the gospel is all of those facts, but it's also the whole doctrine, Galatians 2 and 1 Timothy 1, if it's glorious, if it saves us, if we have to receive it, obey it, and live in it, then why don't we work hard, and we should, to make sure that it's not handled incorrectly, corrupted, manipulated, added to, changed, or anything of that fashion? You say, Jason, I agree with all that. You know what's sad? Most people don't. What do you mean they don't? I'm talking about even the realm of quote-unquote Christianity. They don't believe that. How do you know they don't believe that? Because their ministries is to the quote-unquote whole man. It's all about cookies and, and, and a soft approach to the preaching of the gospel. They don't preach specifics. Oh, there's no Glenn Beck the other day. You talk about a fellow that's messed up, and I like some of the things he says politically, but he can go off the rocker now. I mean, he's a premillennial, Mormon, recovering alcoholic, etc. But he makes statements like this. He was talking about religious groups of all of quote-unquote Christianity. And he said, you know, yeah, I had a man one say one time, they're all fighting and bickering on different doctrines. He said, they're really all saying the same thing. No, they're not saying the same thing. They're not saying the same thing at all. They're saying different things. That's why under their denominations. We should be following just what the Bible teaches and preaches. You say, Jason, we're doing that here. Then let's don't quit. Let's don't quit because the gospel is going to save us. We can't twist it or manipulate it. Someone says, well, Jesus, it doesn't really matter if he's born of a virgin. It does if you want to go to heaven. Does it really matter if he came forth from the grave in a physical body? It does if, it does if, if you believe in a literal bodily resurrection and then it matters if you have hope when you die in the grave. Does it matter? It absolutely matters. These things matter. They matter because the Bible matters. So as I close, I simply want to say that we need to understand how important the gospel is. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. I want to offer the invitation. What do you mean the invitation? I mean, BJ, simply saying, she said before my preach, she said, you always say simply saying. Can you quit saying simply saying? I said, probably not. So simply, I'm simply saying, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 10. Here's what we have. I want to start really in verse 9. It says, The Lord, He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. We couldn't invent a plan of salvation if we tried. That doesn't mean you don't obey the gospel. I've already shown you you have to do that. But according to His own purpose and grace, which was given me in, that's a location, Christ Jesus, before the world began, but is now made manifest, made known, by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ with abolished death. I like that. And if, he doesn't mean people aren't going to die. He means you have hope in your death. He's conquered death. Hebrews says they were all their lifetime 
in fear of death, and now we don't have to be afraid to die. Brother Hall, I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. But we don't have to be afraid to die. Why? The glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't have a prophet who's in a tomb, a dead prophet named Muhammad. I don't serve some little, of, little fat guy named Buddha. I serve the risen Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, the one who saved me from my sins when he built his church, shed his blood, the glorious gospel. It says, our Savior Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I'll tell you, I would weep like no man's weeped if my little grandson Coda were to die. But I know this much, I could see him again because I have the hope of the gospel, the immortality, the immortality of the blessed gospel of Jesus Christ. And let us never forget as we go through this life, we, my friends, as members of the church of Christ, we understand. We have hope. We have purpose. We have direction. We are the Lord's church. We're not ashamed of it. We're simply saying all men should be a part of it. And I hope when you leave here today, you leave encouraged knowing that you have redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness and mercy and grace and hope. Why? Because Jesus Christ came forth from that tomb. If you need to be baptized into Christ to become a Christian, if you need to repent of your sins and you're a fallen brother or sister to come back home, won't you come as we stand and we sing? Amen.